You are a child of God. Do you know it? Do you live it? Do you love it? It's possible to do all of those things because you're a child of God. Now, our passage today looks like it's just about kids uh, with a touch for what dads should or shouldn't be doing. But we're all children of God, so it does apply to all of us. So from your outline, you'll be able to pick up. Our first point is, I'm a child of God, therefore, heaven is my home. And when I think of home, heaven is the place where I really will be able to put my feet up. I'm planning on sleeping for about the first century or so to catch up on everything that's been missed so far. This is John 17. Now, this is the longest recorded prayer that we have of Jesus. And he's praying especially for us. And he says in verse 14 about his disciples, they, meaning we, are not of the world. And with this really interesting little rider that he puts with it, we are not of the world in the same way any more than Jesus himself is not of this world. Isn't that amazing? Both he and we have the same... And just in case you missed it first time round in verse 16, the disciples are not of the world even as I am not of it, says Jesus. He and we are tied in together with our home. Or another verse, this time from a different New Testament letter. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we belong. That's legally where we are anchored, in heaven. And so when we come to living here, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. That's what we are on earth. Our home is heaven. Our citizenship is heaven. Here we are just resident aliens. And that's why to live in this world, planet earth, is to live as Christ. And that's why to die is to gain, because that's when we go home. Shall, so what shall I choose? Well, I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart from this world and be with Christ. That is better by far. But don't plan on bumping yourself off, please. I'm not um, looking forward to any suicide funerals. Why? It is more necessary for everyone else around that I remain in the body. It's important that we live not for ourselves, nor die for ourselves, but rather we are here constantly for others. It's necessary. You are needed, whether you feel it or not, you are needed in this world. God's still got plans for you while ever he keeps you alive. So our home in this world should be a place where heaven resides. Everything that is our true home, our heavenly home, should find its comfortable residence right here, right under your roof. So your home could and should and must be a little foretaste of heaven. So not only is heaven my home, but as a child of God, the church is my family. You are my family. You are my brothers and sisters. We belong to each other. We are family. You need someone? You call on your family. That's what we're here for. Now, how do you get into a family? Well, you can either be born into it, you can be adopted into it, or you can marry into it. First up, you have been born into God's family, or more like you have been born again into God's family. No wonder he's a happy little chap. <laughs> Very famous section, John chapter 3, Jesus and Nicodemus, and the lead-up is to John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The lead up goes way back to verse 3. Jesus said, 
very truly, you get the, the import of this, the, the drive, the strength of which he's speaking. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. It's important. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but it's the spirit that gives birth to spirit. Now, the church can't do that for you. The church can't get you into heaven. The pastor can't get you into heaven. It's only the work of God's spirit that brings about new birth within your spirit. You shouldn't be surprised that Jesus is saying, you must, I think it says it, you must be born again, otherwise you're still spiritually dead. For God so loved the world that he made it available. If you turn back a page or two, you come back from John 3 to John 1. Yet all who did do what? Receive him. To those who did what? Who believed in his name. To them he gave the right to become children of God. This is what it means to be born again to b receive him to believe into him children born of naturally sent or of human sent a husband's will but born of God that's how we're born again and then you can flesh that out the ABC of uh, being saved admit, believe, commitment so in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith Again, not through the church, not through a ritual, not through baptism, not through the Lord's Supper, not through turning up to church every week. But in Christ Jesus, your children of God, through faith. It's the only way that it happens. It's got to be you and Jesus do a transaction together, one-on-one, -on -one, for eternity. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and yet what will be has not yet been made known. For we know that when Christ appears, we'll be like him. Now that's why we sang all those songs about the second coming. Because there's a prophetic aspect to being a child of God. And it works like this. Now, in this world, at this time, we are children who are growing. But when Jesus comes back again, when he appears, we will be like him and we'll be transformed. We'll go from being the really infantile that we are now to being the mature that we belong in heaven. Not only are we born into God's family, the second thing is that we are adopted into God's family as a legal transaction that takes place. The Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit that you received when you were born again brought about your adoption so the spirit not only gives you new birth but legally adopts you as a legitimate family relationship and so it's by him by the, the work of the spirit that we cry the older translation said Abba Father it, it's that really warm relational word we are so close not only are we born but we're adopted into that family in love love from the father to us the father predestined us for our adoption as his children through Christ Jesus now don't get too caught up on being predestined no one ever gets predestined to heaven or to hell it's never in scripture predestination is only for believers and this is what it's predestined to we are predestined to be adopted into his family. We are predestined to live out the righteousness that he gives us. We are predestined to move into a deeper holiness, into a deeper relationship. That's what predestination is. It's the plan that God has for us. You can choose to do it or not, but we're predestined to be adopted as his children. What a great plan. I love that plan. I'll take that predestination any day. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit within us, we groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for our adoption into God's family. Hang on, that says it's still future. 
The other verse is saying it, it's past. And this future adoption is the redemption of our bodies. And for this, we were saved. The salvation, when did it happen? Past tense. We've already got the salvation, but there's still something that we await. And here it is again, this future aspect, this prophetic aspect of being, yes, we are now adopted as children. But children don't have the, the motor skills to be able to do things. They don't have the intellectual capacity to grasp you know, abstract concepts. But when Jesus comes again and our bodies are redeemed, we'll be able to do far more than we imagine right now, just as children might try. You know, I still can't really colour in and stay in the lines. Uh, the motor skills not there well imagine how much better it is for kids when they think ah I can do this how much better it's going to be when we get to heaven and think wow it's so much more than we could dream of when Christ appears we're born we're adopted and we are married into God's family Whatever way you look at it, you're part of the family. There's no wriggling out of it, guys. You just accept it. Uh, learn to love it. It is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and he put his spirit into our hearts as an engagement ring guaranteeing what is to come. This word engagement ring that we get in English, it's the engagement ring, is an unusual word in scripture, but it does pop up from time to time. And it's all about a guarantee. It's the deposit that you would place on a house. It's the surety you would give for a loan repayment. It's, it locks in legally what is to happen. And the Holy Spirit is given to us as God's engagement ring. This is the promise. The wedding is going to take place. And then we look forward. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. What a great day it's going to be when we look forward. This is the engagement period now. But the day is coming when the wedding will take place, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and what a fantastic experience that's going to be. I love a wedding feast at the best of times. <laughs> but everything, this one's going to knock the socks off every wedding you've ever been to. Now, there's an interesting little sidetrack here. What would be a sermon without a sidetrack? Uh, look, you can just park your, your mind somewhere you, to relax through this because it's not critical for what we're doing. We're in Revelation 21. There's, there's only one more chapter left. We're at the second last page. There's 21 and 22 rolling together as the wrap-up. And here it comes. Now, see if you can get your head around this. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Now, this heavenly city, it's Jerusalem. It's not Jerusalem that we know in Israel at the moment. This is, it's a whole new place. It's coming from heaven, not from earth. It's a glorious place. It's a holy place. And now here's an interesting clue. Coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. So the city arrives like a bride. You got that? Yeah, we're talking a lot of symbolism here in Revelation. Watch what happens next when you just come down a few verses. One of the seven angels came to him and said, I will show you the bride. Now, you've read the Bible before. The bride is a symbol for the, the church. The bride is the church, is believers of the redeemed, the righteous. I will show you the bride. So he's going to show in heaven what the church looks like. The wife of the Lamb. Here we are, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he showed me the church. He showed me the bride. He showed me the redeemed ones. And what was it? It was the city that was prepared as a bride. So how interesting 
that we don't actually live in the New Jerusalem. We are the New Jerusalem. And all that symbolism about what the city is like is not telling us where we will live, but it's telling us how we will live. Now, all that will come when we get to chapter 21 of Revelation. Don't hold your <laughs> breath. The second coming will probably happen first. It's a sidetrack. We can talk about it over a cuppa. Now, <coughs> back to your uh, sheet. I'm a child of God and I'm in the process of growing. Now, some of you know what it's like to have some growing pains, but we're in the process as children of God of growing. Little babies are so sweet, but you know, 20 years down the track, you don't want to be doing the same things for them as you're doing when they're days old. Oh, remember our text? <laughs> we, we did start here. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is what we are to do. We are to live. We are the children of God. We've got that so far. And as children of God, we are to obey the one who is our father. It makes sense, doesn't it? Okay? Now, Jesus modelled it. Twelve-year-old Jesus returned to Nazareth with Joseph and Mary and he was obedient to him. That works even, if you like, in a blended family, a step family. <laughs> and look at how often it just comes up in Jesus' teaching. He says, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. You want to be blessed? Everyone wants to be blessed. You can only be blessed. I, I walk into my barber and he says, oh, bless me, Father. Uh, I pray for him. I pray with him. And he's very excited. But the blessing comes as he obeys God's word, not as he cuts people's hair. We pray blessing anyway. You know, there's, there's a loophole here. Anyone who loves me will do what? Will obey. Love and obedience go together. I want, Lord, I want to do what you want because I love you. Or again, thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey. This is what's making the difference. To obey and look at the way the three things come together. From your heart, the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You can obey, but it need not necessarily be with your heart. You know, it's like if you've had kids, say sorry to your sister. Hmm. Say sorry, sorry. <laughs> it didn't really come from the heart, did it? You know what that's like. But as we come to obey, it's coming out of our heart. It's not coming out of duty. It's coming out of the heart. It's coming out of a deeper place, a better place. And it's becoming a pattern. It's not just, oh, okay, I'll do it because I have to do it. But I'm developing as I'm growing a pattern, a regularity. Something is building into my life, a growing obedience so that it claims my allegiance. And so obeying God's word might seem at first difficult or taxing, but as it becomes a pattern, then obedience becomes easier. And as we are aligned to, as we are in allegiance to God himself, then obedience becomes the joy. And you think, how could I do otherwise? So what do we do? We demolish arguments and every pretension which sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, where have, are you going to find thoughts? It's not a trick question here. Yeah, think about it. <laughs> the problem is inside me. I need to take my thoughts captive. The arguments and pretensions. Look, if you want an excuse to sin, come to me. I've got a million of them. I, I can lie to myself. I can fool myself. I can come up with every excuse under the sun why I don't have to obey and why I can just go the way of the world. 
but we are needing to bring every thought captive. Round them up, tie them up, and you know, do what needs to be done to make us obedient to Christ. <laughs> now, you're looking for a loophole to this. You know, look, I'm always looking for the loophole. Right? I've got to bring every thought captive. Apologies to the lawyers amongst us. <laughs> but the loopholes. Children, obey your parents. That sounds pretty straightforward. But here's the loophole that you are looking for. <laughs> obey them in the Lord. Because even the most good and godly parents might sometimes get it wrong. Our obedience is not strictly at a human level. Yes, obey them where we can. But when it's a choice, and it usually isn't, but if it ever became a choice between God and man, we always pick God because we're following his commandments. It's the instruction of the Lord. That's what we're tuning into. If your parents were perfect and always got it right, they would have always been righteous. But if they're not, then we need to choose righteousness. Now, you can't see the picture very well on the, uh, the big screen, but it's the words that matter. Uh, Peter and John have been flogged for disobeying the, uh, the local uh, council and Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God, but we don't necessarily have to obey you. We will if we can, but if it's a choice, we must obey God rather than man. Because... Man's laws, whatever they are, cannot make moral what God has declared is immoral. It doesn't matter what the human law is. If God has said otherwise, the choice is always God. Now, speaking of loopholes, do you have to still obey your parents when you become an adult and your parents are starting... <laughs> Stop there, eh? <laughs> when you're an adult, what we're doing is moving through a process. We're moving from this where a child is completely dependent upon the parent. We go from this through this, where the child is learning to live realistically outside the realm of being the parent until ultimately you get to the point where you can stand shoulder to shoulder an adult child with a senior parent as equals shoulder to shoulder together against whatever might come up and if you're parenting well if you're doing it right and if your kids are doing it right then this is what it's going to look like in the end Becoming an adult. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put away the things of childishness. It says, honour your father and mother. This is a command. You know, the loophole was there with obey. There's no loophole when it becomes a command. Obedience can be an external thing. It, it can be done without heart. But to honour your parents is something that has to be done. First of all, it's a command to honour, but it's something that can only be done internally. It doesn't require ex anything external to be done even. You can still honour your parents by doing nothing. But we are to obey where we can and honour because... It's commanded. Now, relationships. Let's have a quick look at how relationships function. There are eternal relationships, enduring relationships and enriching relationships. Now, the eternal relationships is obviously a relationship with God. That's the one that will last forever and we need to grow this relationship. To grow in our relationship with Father, Son and Spirit because that's a relationship that's going to last through all eternity. The enduring relationships are family relationships. You're born into this family. 
Some of them are better than others. You grow the relationship if it's a healthy relationship. Some families are actually quite toxic. And if you are wise, you will minimize and manage someone who is related to you but is not good for you. Uh, you will need God's wisdom and you'll need the, the help of the rest of your family here who are able to help support and give wisdom for these relationships. And then there are, there are enriching relationships which come and go. You'll have friends, that people who dropped into your life and stayed for a short or long time and, and you'll think, I wonder whatever happened to so-and-so. You know, they're not your life, but they're people who've dropped into your life and sometimes you, there are people that you embrace while they're there and let go and perhaps even you have to cut them off. Um, they're useful for a time but not for always. So pick how you use and how you develop your relationships. I love graphs. I can't live without graphs. Look at this. The, the, the vertical line is marital satisfaction. How happy are you? Uh, the happier you are, the higher up the line you go. And then there's a timeline along the bottom and it's related to what happens. Now, start on the, the left-hand side. Married without children. Look how happy everybody is <laughs> when you've got the house to yourself. Kids arrive. Where does the happiness level go? To the floor. And, and oh, whew. they go off to school and things start to, to bounce. Well, this is getting better. Okay, I can survive this until you have teenagers move into the house. What happens? It's the worst time of your life. Who invented teenagers, for goodness sake? But if you can get through that, you'll survive almost anything. They, st they leave home. And look what happens when they start to leave home. <laughs> what a relief. Things just keep getting better and better. And by the time they've all gone and it's back to just the two of you, whew, what a relief. How did, how did we ever survive? How did our parents survive us? Oh, no, no, don't ask that question. <laughs> now, there's, some, there's a couple of interesting other things just to pick up before we leave this. Some of these people, some of these studies show that people weren't all that happy when they were left alone finally. Some of them on the other hand were happier than ever. Now look at the, the two study groups who ended up at the most unhappy. They were first of all the one who started off and spent most of the time being most unhappy and it's also the one who started off way, way, perhaps realis unrealistically happy. It was the princess bride. It was the, the big flashy wedding, perhaps. Both for those who started the highest and the lowest, they ended up being the least happy. Whereas those who survived the long run ended up being even happier in the end than the honeymoon. Take heart. The, it can be better than the honeymoon. Woohoo! <laughs> Here's something else that's really interesting. It's a completely different study, but it follows the same deal. You see the, down the timeline how um, it follows the same pattern. But this time, instead of being how happy you are, how well engaged you are in your church, in your faith. When you're single, before you get married, you're doing pretty well. You get married, and how does your um, spiritual life travel? Boom. Getting married is not good for your spiritual well-being. Because, any suggestions? You get so absorbed in the things of this world that the things that matter eternally are pushed way to the background. But, kids start to arrive, you get sleep-deprived, you have needs and responsibilities and look what happens to the graph. Your spiritual life trends upward and it's never higher than when you've got teenagers 
and they're about to leave home. It's as bad as it gets, as bad as it gets at home, and the worst things are at home. Your lowest spirit, uh, marital satisfaction is your best spiritual time. But then the kids leave home, you're happy. And what happens to your spiritual life? It drops off again. You just get caught up in the things of this world. Now, it doesn't have to be like that, but that's a trend of the world. Or not even the world, it's a trend of the church. Can you buck the trend? Can you be so in tune that you don't lose it as you get older? That spiritually you just keep getting stronger, you keep getting more vibrant spiritually, you keep on growing in the Lord and you become better in the end than you were in the beginning. Back to our outline sheet. I'm a child of God because God is my Father. I love this painting. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. And he begins with our Father. That's the relationship. And it's prayer that builds that relationship more than anything else. Children, obey your parents. Now, let's just bring it right back here to us sitting in this room right now. In some ways, we are the parent. In some ways, we are the child. We're all children of God, so we sit together as children. But we're family, and in some ways, we are the parent of the other children of God. We need each other in both roles to run parallel. There are times when I'm just not handling it, and I want to be the child, and I need someone like you to be the adult, the responsible adult in my life, even to the point of telling me what to do. Don't exasperate me when I'm like that, but what to do? Bring me up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That's what we need to do for each other. We're here for each other to be children together and to just celebrate and to play and to enjoy and to laugh and to have fun because we're children of God. But also to nurture, instruct and train and to grow up one another into maturity so that we can indeed grow in the family likeness. And what's the family likeness? To grow in the grace of and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Grace comes first. Grace always comes first. And then add some knowledge. That's the family likeness and the family relationship. Make your love increase and even overflow. Don't settle for half full. Don't settle for being full up. But overflow with love for each other and where you can for others as well. We are children of a loving Heavenly Father. Let me pray for us. Father, what a joy it is to be yours, to know that you accept us. We don't have to perform because we're just children. What can we do but just sit in your lap and, and laugh and cry and just be ourselves? Father, thank you for the love that you have for us that makes us and accepts us as your child. But help us to not stay acting as infants, but to grow to the maturity so that we take on the responsibilities that are ours as one adopted, as one who has a legal standing and as one who is to be married in the immediate future. Oh Lord, that we would be your family and bring joy to your heart this day and forever and ever. Amen. Amen.